Hi, my name is Monty Johnson. I teach philosophy at the University of California, San Diego, and this is the first of two lectures on Aristotle's Politics, Book Two, on the criticism of model constitutions, beginning with Plato's Republic and Laws. And I'm using the translation of Benjamin Jowett, Oxford, 1921, which is in the public domain. Now, first of all, an outline of the overall book. In chapter one, Aristotle discusses the study of model constitutions, both fictional and real, the purpose of studying them, and he says a little about the method of studying them. Then chapters two to six are dedicated to a detailed criticism of two of Plato's dialogues. In chapters two to five, his Republic, and then the single chapter six devoted to his laws. After that, in chapter seven and eight, we have a criticism of other fictional proposals, including those of Thalius and Hippodamus. Then in chapters nine to 11, a criticism of real constitutional models, actually existing constitutions, the constitutions of the Spartans, of the Cretans, and the Carthaginians. Then in the final chapter, which uh, somewhat appears like an appendix, Aristotle discusses Solon and other famous legislators. But there's actually a, an organized methodology and reason why Aristotle follows this process, and it basically has to do with him thinking that Plato's proposals in the Republic are the most radical and most detailed, and those in the laws are less radical, those of Phalius and Hippodamus even less so, and then even less radical than all of those are the actually existing models, beginning with the most complete and uh, radical in its own way, Spartan constitution, of which the Cretan and Carthaginian can be discussed uh, in terms of their differences with that. And then Aristotle concludes by discussing those who, whose political theory doesn't extend to the entire constitution and entire and conceiving of an entire constitution of a state but rather just a specific laws and pieces of legislation so here's what he says about the examination of model constitutions in the first chapter he says that our purpose this is a quote is to consider what form of political community is best of all for those who are most able to realize their ideal of life. So one purpose of what we're doing is to conceive of the best form of, communi of political community for those most able to realize their ideal end of life. So it's ideal in two senses, both that all of the people reach the their ideal of life and that the political community itself is best of all. But he adds, quote, we must therefore examine not only this, but other constitutions, both such as actually exist in well-governed states and any theoretical forms which are held in esteem that what is good and useful may be brought to light. So the point is to look both at fictional proposals and actually existing states and see if there's anything good in any of them which we ought to bring into our consideration. Now, in a later book, book four in the first chapter, Aristotle distinguishes between actually four related inquiries. First, the inquiry into what is the best constitution under any circumstances whatsoever. Second, what is the best constitution under specific circumstances or for specific kinds of people? He says, quote, for the best is often unattainable, and therefore the true legislator and statesman ought to be acquainted not only with that which is best in the abstract, but also with that which is best relatively to circumstances. And those two questions are distinguished from a third question, what is the best means of preserving any given kind of constitution on the hypothesis that it would be good to preserve it? And that those can again be distinguished from a fourth question. What is the constitution that's best suited for most circumstances and for most kinds of people? Quote, not only what form of government is best, but also what is possible and what is easily attainable by all. 
So each of those are different questions, and it seems that in this book two, we're mostly concerned with the first question. What is the best constitution under any circumstances? Because people like Plato seem to have proposed an answer to such a question, and Aristotle has criticisms of them. But some of these criticisms pertain to what is actually possible under specific circumstances, what is best hypothetically, supposing we want to promote a certain kind of virtue, and also what is what would really be best under for most circumstances and most kinds of people. So those four inquiries which are presented as distinct in book four are in a way all pursued in this second book. Now the first and most important issue that divides these uh, model constitutions and distinguishes them from one another and then from really existing constitutions is their approach to property, private versus common property. And Aristotle discusses that the theoretical possibilities for constitutions are determined by what is or is not shared in common by the citizens. And he discusses three conceivable alternatives. First, the members of a state could have nothing in common. Second, the members of the state uh, could have all things so far as possible in common. Or a third possibility, the members of the state may have some things in common and other things not in common. Now, the first alternative he immediately eliminates. It is, quote, clearly impossible for the members of a state to have nothing in common because the Constitution is a community and it, at any rate must have at least a common place that they all live together. So they must share that. And so it's not possible to imagine that members of a state, elements of a state, have nothing in common. So the real possibilities are that the members of the state have all things in common so far as that's possible or that they merely have some things in common. So for the second possibility that they may have all things in common so far as possible, he presents the example of citizens having wives and children and all of their property in common as Socrates proposes in the Republic of Plato. Now, as for the view that the members of the state should have some things in common, but other things not in common, and among the things they should not have in common in Aristotle's view are wives and children, so this third option ends up being Aristotle's view. So he criticizes Plato in general for trying to make all th the citizens have all things as far as that's possible in common. And Aristotle asks, which is better? Our present condition, where we do have some things in common in our state, but other things not, like wives and children are not held in common, or what he calls the proposed new order of society, as if Plato's Republic is a proposal for a new order of society in which as many things as possible are held in common, a kind of communism that extends even into families to include wives and children. Now that brings us to Aristotle's criticism of Plato's Republic. Just to say a couple of things about Plato's Republic in general, because even though you've read uh, book two of Aristotle's politics, you may not have had a chance to read Plato's Republic, though it's one of the most famous works of philosophy. We call it Plato's Republic in English because the Latin title is De Re Publica. The Greek title is Politeia. It's in uh, 10 books, so it's a, a, a fairly long and extensive work in which Aristotle, Socrates is depicted as discussing the ideal political arrangement and various inferior alternatives, including democracy. Now, note that the Greek title of Plato's book means something like commonwealth or constitutional government, that is constitution of the state or polis, and the title of Aristotle's politics, which we take from the Latin politica, really means things concerned with the state or the polis. Now, in a later chapter, at the end of book two, 
Aristotle actually returns very briefly to discuss and summarize Plato's views in the Republic, and he summarizes that in one sentence that divides into four parts. He says, particular to Plato, and he's referring to the Republic, is one, the community of women, children, and property, which we've just been discussing. Second, the common meals of women. And third, the law about drinking, that the sober should be masters of the feast. And four, that the training of soldiers to acquire by practice equal skill with both hands, so that one should be as useful as the other. Now this kind of looks like a grab bag of topics and hardly like a crisp summary of the entire point of the Republic, or even of the Republic and the laws, which he may be meaning to summarize uh, here as well. But the first pertains to the communism of women, children, and property, and that is a major issue, and that is the major issue on which Aristotle will engage Plato's views. The importance of common, wheel, common meals for women is that it means giving women equality in education, military, and political spheres. So that's actually a completely radical suggestion and a separate suggestion from holding women, children, and property in common. This is that women ought to be uh, educated um, equally and deployed equally for military and political purposes. The third, the law about drinking that the sober should be masters of the feast, um, is really something discussed in book two of Plato's laws most extensively. And the idea there is that the state should get involved in regulating the temperance and moderation, encouraging those virtues, and so should actually encourage controlled situations in which drinking occurs to ensure that people uh, are able to enjoy and take pleasure in moderation and temperately, so that we're training them not only for the virtue of courage, like the Spartans do, but also for uh, a virtue that is useful in peacetime, the enjoyment of pleasure and leisure. So that is a pretty important and innovative uh, point of Plato's. Now, the fourth point about the which looks like, on the surface, a point about ambidexterity of training of soldiers so that they can use swords with their left or their right hand might be an underhanded reference to the involvement of women in the military. The Pythagoreans considered uh, the male factor to be on the right, the female factor to be on the left hand side, and this may be related to, again, that radical idea of incorporating both women and men into the military, or it may actually be a point about training ambidexterity, which Plato does lead, lead, put some emphasis on in the Republic. So that's an interesting summary of how Plato's Republic is conceived insofar as it relates to the project of the second book of the politics, and that's determining proposals relevant to the entire constitution. Now, Aristotle's overarching criticism of Plato, in a way pertaining to each of these ideas, is that Plato has his Socrates advocate an excessive unification of the state. So Aristotle says, quote, the argument of Socrates proceeds that the greater the unity of the state, the better. So Plato wants a maximally unified state. He wants everybody agreeing about not just the ends of the state, but the means that are used to reach them. And this agreement um, and consensus, uh, Plato takes to be a sign of a, of a healthy and well-functioning political society. But Aristotle rejects that principle as stated. So he does not think that the greater the unity is necessarily the better, because the greater degree of unity, he thinks, must come at the cost of a lesser degree of self-sufficiency. And so here he sets up a comparison between three degrees of unity and three degrees of self-sufficiency. So if we take an individual person, an individual person is as unified as it gets. They have organic unity. They're a single organism. But in Aristotle's political philosophy, they are the least self-sufficient. They 
there's very little that an individual totally isolated from any family or city can do as a human. As he says in book one, anybody that could uh, flourish outside of a city must be either a beast or a god. Humans can't. Humans are political animals, and they are only self-sufficient within the context of a family, which is in the context of a city. So a family is a somewhat unified entity, clearly not as unified as an individual person, but it is somewhat more self-sufficient than an individual. So an individual can flourish and do a lot more in a family context than they can as an isolated uh, hermit in which they can barely do anything or cultivate any uh, virtue. But the family, a, a single family unit compared to a city is uh, the family unit might be more unified, but it is less self-sufficient. So the city is the least degree of unity because it is a unity of several families and families are uh, unities of several individuals. So the city is the least unified, but it is the most self-sufficient self-sufficient because the city can exist without any particular family, but a family cannot exist in Aristotle's sense without being in some kind of city. And just as um, Aristotle thinks that um, a family consists of individuals, so he thinks a city consists of several uh, families, but there is a substantial or existential priority here that the city can exist without the uh, family or without any individual, but an individual or a family cannot exist without any city. So therefore, the unity that uh, Socrates seeks in Plato's uh, Republic, he seeks to turn a city into a greater degree of unity to become something more like a family and even possibly pushing it to become something like an individual when he compares it to the psychological unity of the three parts of the soul. But his political pro proposals amount to unifying the city to become like a single family, which certainly makes it more unified, but it thereby, according to Aristotle, makes it less self-sufficient. So since self-sufficiency is a good, this excessive unification of a city into a family has at least one disadvantage, and having that disadvantage means that it's not always good. So that's not the best thing uh, for him to do. Now, Aristotle's alternative to unifying the state into a family, he calls reciprocal equality that exists between ruler and ruled, basically taking turns ruling and being ruled. He says that the excessive unification of the kind proposed by Plato in the Republic would lead to the destruction of the state. Reciprocal equality, on the other hand, which he advocates, leads to its salvation. So let's look in some more detail why he thinks this reciprocal equality is the salvation of the state that the excessive unification would be the destruction of. Well, he says, quote, Wherefore, the principle of compensation or reciprocal equality, as I have already remarked in the ethics, is the salvation of states. Now, by the way, that's, he's referring there to the second common book of the ethics on justice. That's Eudemian Ethics Book 4, Nicomachean Ethics Book 5, and he's referring specifically to the arguments in Chapter 5 there where he describes reciprocal equality, meaning that each party to a transaction, the paradigm example is some kind of exchange or trade between a buyer and seller, where buyer and seller are treated as exact equals, and it's just the difference, we, we look at the differences between the things that they're exchanging and try to equalize those. We don't try to equalize the buyer and seller, we assume that they are equal. If we were to assume that they were unequal, then we would have to equalize not just the goods that are exchanged, but somehow compensate for the value or preeminence of one of the parties to the exchange. Now, Aristotle says, quote, even among freemen and equals, this 
is a principle, this principle of reciprocal equality, which must be maintained, for they cannot all rule together, but must change at the end of a year, or some other period of time, or in some order of succession. The result is that upon this plan, they all govern, just as if shoemakers and carpenters were to exchange their occupations, and the same persons did not always continue shoemakers and carpenters. Now, I, that's the end of the quote, and I provide this whole quote because it shows Aristotle bringing in his own political analysis into a criticism of uh, Plato here. His preference would be that all of the people doing the governing are treated as equals, not treated as parts of the same family, but as, are treated as equal to each other, and then they exchange by some kind of order of succession or after some period of time the job or the office of ruling, and they are equally willing to take up being ruled. And this ruling and being ruled is the essence of politics, according to Aristotle. And so he would rather maintain this, which he considers a political structure, and not convert the political structure of equality into a dense and overly tightened, unified family structure in which there is not politics, but rather there is uh, forms of um, power and rule and domination that may be analogous to politics, but really have some other purpose, some uh, paternalistic or even despotic purpose. So in Aristotle's view, and here he asserts it, equals should take up and rule in turn, and when they're out of rule, they should be treated as um, equals as well, and that equality is what we should be searching for in politics, not uh, unification. Now, he presents several criticisms of Plato's communism of property. Um, he repeats the criticisms that we've just been discussing, that the state should have less unity than a family, excessive, excessive unification would destroy its self-sufficiency, presumably by destroying the possibility of division of uh, labor. So um, again, we could talk about pushing the unity of the family. If unity is such a great thing, we could unify the family and conceive of the family as just being like a single individual. But then we wouldn't be able to divide the kinds of labor that happen within the household. And just as we wouldn't be able to do that if we were to unify the family into an individual, so if we were to unify the state into an individual family, we would lose some articulation or division of labor, and that's why we would lose self-sufficiency. Aristotle also criticizes Plato's proposed linguistic reform, according to which Everyone should say mine and not mine at the same time and with respect to the same things. Socrates says that this would be a sign of the perfect unity of the state. But Aristotle criticizes this, distinguishing two senses of the term all. He says there's a distributive sense. For example, if all say, this is my son, then this all seems to apply to each and every one, but the object is multiple several sons, so it's understood if I say this is my son and my friend says this is my son, that they're pointing to different people and there are several different objects, and thus the feeling of ownership is strong. But there's also a collective sense of all. So if all say this is my city, then the all clearly applies to everyone and the object is singular. Well, we're all referring to one city. You know, this San Diego is my city. Multiple people living here in San Diego can say this is my city, but the feeling of ownership is weak. A lot different than if I say this is my son or this is my daughter. Now, Plato's proposal, Aristotle suggests, would only result in a weak feeling. I would say, oh, that's my son about some random child I saw across the street but the feeling would be very weak, not at all like the one I really have if I think that it's my biological offspring or my adopted child. Uh, and so this would not, in fact, unify the state. This distinction between a distributive and a collective sense would um, 
still be observed, and so there would not be a strong effect of unifying the state. Now, Aristotle also points out or asserts that what is held in common is the least taken care of. He says, quote, for that which is common to the greatest number has the least care bestowed upon it. Everyone thinks chiefly of his own, hardly at all of the common interest, and only when he is himself concerned as an individual. For besides other considerations, everyone is more inclined to neglect the duty which he expects another to fulfill. As in families, many attendants are often less useful than a few. End of quote. Now, this has become known recently as the so-called tragedy of the commons, that if, for example, grazing land is held in common, it will be less taken care of. People will tend to overgraze it, whereas they wouldn't do that to their own property that they held privately because they wouldn't want it to be destroyed. Now, that's asserted to be a principle. Essentially, what is held in common is less, less taken care of than what is held privately. But it's not at all clear what the warrant for that uh, claim is. And it certainly doesn't really have the status of a self-evident principle, if you think about it. The story about grazing land might suggest something, but if we really look at uh, property that's held privately and compare it with property that's held uh, by the public, do we always find that private property holders take better care of their property than property that's held by the state? Probably not. So this is a questionable assumption of Aristotle's, but there's some persuasive element at least to it, and it can be uh, leveled as a criticism of Plato's communism. Now, Aristotle goes into a lot of detail over chapters 3 and 4 about problems with Plato's community of wives and children. To the extent that children were actually commonly held, he argues, this would result in a lot of neglect in accordance with the principle just stated, that what is held in common is most neglected. So you would essentially be encouraging uh, child neglect by saying that all of putting them in a common store and saying that we all uh, own them in common or have them in common. And, but Aristotle asserts that really people, again, wouldn't have that strong of a feeling about that and they would tend to identify their own children because of inherited resemblances, resemblances that he has a theory about how they are inherited in his biological work, The Generation of Animals, and he says there's nothing that could avoid people saying that's obviously that person's child. And so my claim that it's my child as well in accordance with this communistic slogan um, wouldn't cut any ice against that uh, biological recognition. Also, Socrates' proposals about families, Aristotle says, would make certain crimes worse. So there would be a greater chance that assaults and homicides are committed unwittingly against fathers and mothers or near relations, um, but this would be both harder to detect and expatiate. Now, to some extent, this works against the previous point. This assumes that it wouldn't be the, that easy to identify one's own children or parents, and so that children would sometimes make mistakes, and while they just meant to kill someone, they didn't really mean to kill their father, but then supposedly it would be difficult to establish they actually did kill their father, and it would be more difficult to go through the process of expatiating that particular crime. Also, Socrates' proposals about incest are said to be confused, so he outlaws homosexual intercourse, but he permits kissing and touching, and Aristotle says this: the one leads to the other, and so that... Uh, proposal will be impracticable. Also, the proposed communism of wives and children is better suited, he thinks, for the lowest classes than for the higher classes or the guardian class, but Plato proposes just the reverse, that the ruling or guardian class would be the one holding wives and children in common, but it's not clear that that would happen or clear that it wouldn't happen for the lower producing class. 
Now, uh, Socrates' proposals, Aristotle argues, would destroy friendship, which is the key to holding states together. So if we have communism of wives and children, it'll water down our love and affection, which is naturally held between those that we know are biologically related to us directly and within our own family. And there's something important about the love and friendship of a family unit that would be broken down and destroyed if I'm supposed to treat everyone as if they were part of this family unit. Furthermore, transferring between the classes would be problematic, so there's no way to know in advance who from among the lower class should be transferred to the ruling guardian class and vice versa. And when transferred to another class, anyone would have less reason to refrain from crime because the consanguinity would be removed. So Plato thinks that, you know, natural-born rulers ought to be part of the guardian class, and those who aren't fit to rule, even if they are born to guardian parents, should be transferred into the lower class and be uh, farmers and producers. Uh, but the, um, the scheme of holding wives and children in common would make this more difficult. Now, in chapter 5, Aristotle returns to the discussion of common property, and not just wives and children and how those are held in common, but private property itself as opposed to common property. He says, quote, next let us consider what should be our arrangements about property. Should the citizens of the perfect state have their possessions in common or not? This question may be discussed separately from the enactments about women and children. So there are three possible arrangements, whatever we do with, with women and children, when we're talking about things now like um, land, livestock, buildings, tools, and so on. There are several possible arrangements for holding this property in common. The first is that the soil or the land may be appropriated, but the produce, so whatever we're growing from it, the corn or whatever, may be thrown for consumption into the common stock. This is the practice of some nations, and this ends up being Aristotle's considered preference. He thinks that um, land should be privately owned, but from what is produced on that land, some should be extracted basically in the form of taxation and put into the common stock and then somehow distributed from there. But another option is that the soil is held in common and cultivated in common, but then we take the produce, like the corn, from it and we distribute that among individuals for their private use. He says this is a form of common property which is said to exist among certain barbarians. And the third option is that we would hold both the soil and the produce uh, in common alike. Now, both two and three, Aristotle argues, so any um, option of holding the land in common will occasion quarrels when some end up toiling more on that land but receive less in the produce, while others toil less but end up receiving more of the produce. Neither of those are available, avoidable on the second or third options, and that's why Aristotle prefers that you have private property, but some, kind, some way to, to bring in common the consumption or the use of it. So here are several problems that he discusses with the common property arrangements. Again, holding property in common occasions disputes, and he supports this by appealing to some homely examples, like the example of fellow travelers. Um, if you and I are traveling, hitchhiking through Europe together, then we'll probably end up falling out over everyday matters and trifles. Similarly, if we hold all of our property in common, then little things about, for example, not putting tools back in exactly the right place will end up causing um, disputes and even falling out, and this will affect the unity and consensus in the state. Another example is um, servants. Aristotle says that one is most offended by the failures of those servants with whom one works most closely. So if we all work so closely together as we would with our individual servants, 
then we would become most offended by each other's disappointing failures, and again, the unity of the state would be undermined. The best arrangement, he says, is when property is owned privately but made available for common use. For then owners don't neglect their property because they love it, but they make it available for their friends whom they, all, they also love. So this achieves the best of both worlds. Now examples of this can be found among the Spartans, who use one another's slaves, horses, and dogs as if they were their own. And he says the legislator should try to cultivate such a benevolent disposition among all citizens so that they will all willingly share the property that they all in fact hold privately. Common property also, he says, deprives citizens of an opportunity to exercise the virtues of liberality and temperance. Liberality, because if all things are held in common, then one can't show any generosity or kindness. Like, I can't give, give you something because you already own it. I can't give you flowers or chocolates because we already hold those in common, so I'm not giving them to you. They were already yours. So generosity or kindness of that type becomes impossible. But he says temperance becomes impossible because if all wives are held in common, then I did, won't have an opportunity to show moderation by refraining or abstaining from intercourse with other people's wives. Since they aren't those other people's wives anymore, there won't be any problem with doing it, and so um, as if everybody's moderation will disappear at that point, and they won't be temperate. Furthermore, and perhaps more seriously, he says common property doesn't have the benefits that it appears to have, but has many disadvantages. So supposedly it would eliminate suits over contracts, convictions for perjury, flattery of the rich, and so on, which are said to be due to private property. But in fact, all of these bad things, okay, suits, suing people over contracts, uh, perjury, flattery of the rich, all of those bad things, Aristotle says, are due to human vices. They're not due to the property itself. And it's due to quarrels among those holding property in common that can be expected to remain the same if their characters do. So if you do nothing to affect their characters but just change who is supposed to own the property, the characters will remain the same, the vices will remain the same, and the um, litigious society, the perjurous uh, people, the flattery of the rich, all of that will continue because its root cause hasn't been uh, addressed. And in fact, those things will all be made much worse. Now, besides the criticism of the scheme for holding wives and children in common and then the communism of property, Aristotle also offers some general criticisms of Plato's Republic. One general theoretical uh, criticism that he again repeats in this chapter is that the excessive unification of anything will destroy it. There is theoretical value in maintaining diversity and plurality among the elements, and this is eliminated when we try to squeeze all of the diverse and plural elements of the city into a single family. He makes the argument here, but he but introduces some new examples from music. So he says, you know, harmonies are destroyed when they're reduced to unison, and rhythm is destroyed when it's reduced to a single foot, and so the city would be destroyed if it reduced to a single family. He also says, you know, on the basis of experience, he rejects these proposals. Quote, we should not disregard the experience of ages. In the multitude of years, these things, if they were good, would certainly not have been unknown, for almost everything has been found out. Although sometimes they are not put together, in other cases, men do not use the knowledge which they have. So this relates to Aristotle's project of empirical investigation of the histories of actual constitutions. He uh, himself, or with the assistance of his students and other collaborators, wanted to study a hundred and more than 150 Greek constitutions, get the histories of them all, and take that kind of data, and then come up with a theory to explain the data. And he notices that um, 
in the midst of this research, we don't find anything like Plato's Republic, and so it hasn't been tried. If it was a good idea, it's probably something that would have been tried. And this is interesting for what it says about Plato's concept of the possibility of progressive politics, of doing something entirely new in politics. And we've seen, for example, with the case of, of slavery or his rejection of the equality of women, that Aristotle's proposals end up being fairly conservative. They don't radically upset the order of society as it's been seen in the empirical examples that he's investigated, extensive though those are. Now, Plato's um, entire account, and this is a pretty major criticism he makes, Plato's entire account is entirely focused on the guardians, and he says almost nothing about the lowest class, the, the producers, which are in fact the majority of his city. But this kind of treatment gives rise to a dilemma, says Aristotle. Either the lowest class will also hold wives and children in common and have the same kind of education as the guardians, in which case they don't differ from the guardians and have no reason to submit to their rule, or the lowest class would hold wives and children privately, like other states do, and have the different kinds of education than the ruling class, like other states do, in which case Plato's state won't be a unity at all, but rather will be two different states, the state of the guardians and the state of the producing class, the working class. Working and ruling class would essentially form two different cities. And the ruling class of the guardians would be like an occupying garrison of the other city, even if quarrels are eliminated among the guardians, the problem of quarrels among farmers and artists will remain, and Plato says nothing about that. Also, another major criticism is that the guardians can't be happy. Happy here, Aristotle uses in a very conventional sense. They can't enjoy the use of private property, and they can't exercise all of the virtues. For example, he showed why they can't exercise liberality uh, or certain kinds of temperance. And not being able to exercise those virtues, they can't be perfectly happy, and also not being able to enjoy private property, they can't be perfectly happy. But neither can his lowest class be happy, because they don't have an, much private property, and they certainly can't exercise all the virtues, because they don't have any time to cultivate virtues since they're doing all the work. So if happiness exists in neither of these parts of the city, then it would be absurd to think that it exists in the whole state. So then Aristotle compares it to a mathematical case. It's not like the even, which may exist in a whole, for example, four, the number four, even if it's not in either part of the number four. So both three and one are um, odd, but when they are summed together, they create something that's even. He says, politics isn't like this. You have to be able to have happiness in each class in order to say that the city is happy, but Plato's proposal removes and precludes this possibility of happiness and with it the ultimate end of the state. Because again, as he says at the beginning of book one, the purpose of politics and the purpose of a state is to create an association for the sake of the good life and for happiness. So after all of those criticisms of Plato's Republic, Aristotle moves on to criticize Plato's laws. He says, in many ways, Plato's Republic is not an adequate account. Not only is it vulnerable to the preceding objections, but it also lacks an account of many crucial issues, such as the ones we've just been discussing, the lowest class. Now, the laws was Plato's latest work, and it's a quite long work, 12 books, even longer than uh, The Republic, but it's taken to be kind of Plato's final word on politics, and also to be a either a recasting of the utopian scheme of The Republic, or even a less utopian idea and something that's more practically realizable. But against this idea that it's more practically realizable is the fact that it's lacking an account on so many crucial issues. 
And according to Aristotle, the proposals of the laws basically amount to the same thing as the Republic, just without the controversial community of women and property, even though common meals are extended to women. And there's also little direct discussion of the Constitution in Plato's laws, presumably because it's focused on laws and not the Constitution. Now, Aristotle considers Plato's projection of 5,000 citizens to be unrealistic, given how large the population of wives and slaves and thus the territory to house them would have to be. And he, in making this criticism, it's, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, because he says, in framing an ideal, we may assume what we wish, but should avoid impossibilities. So we have to reject utopian proposals that aren't, in some sense, pragmatic. Second, it shows the limit of the size of what Aristotle considers a legitimate political entity. It actually has to be quite small, fewer than 5,000 citizens. And Aristotle does not imagine a political, a per se political association possible that is larger than that. His is a very small scale conception of politics where basically all the citizens being equal, know each other, recognize each other, basically are on a first name basis with each other and then they can work out their differences and find a way to create what they all agree to be the good life. But when you get too many people, you can't speak to them all, you can't know them all, they can't all hear all of the political speeches that each other are making and so you can't really have an effective form of government. And he thinks that Plato basically uh, proposes a population that's too high to make effective government possible. Plato also supposedly ignores the relationship between his state and others by focusing only on the people and the country, and Aristotle says that his account of military forces is inadequate. It's not clear, by the way, how much more adequate Aristotle's own account is, but that doesn't necessarily undercut the criticism that Plato's is not adequate. Also, Plato is unclear about how much property the citizens are supposed to possess. Quote, Socrates says that a man should have so much property as will enable him to live temperately, which is only a way of saying to live well. This is too general a conception. Furthermore, a man may live temperately and yet miserably. That's the end of the quote. So according to Aristotle, a better standard would be that, quote, a man must have so much property as will enable him to live not only temperately, but also liberally. That is, that means with generosity. If the two are parted, liberality will combine with luxury and temperance will be associated with toil. So if we don't allow enough property, and here Aristotle seems to mean private property, then Again, we can't be liberal or generous in giving it away, can't give you something you already own, and if I, or if I don't have enough of it to give a, a, away, and thus um, liberality will require a, a luxurious amount of goods that's excessive to what other people have, and then temperance or you know, only having a moderate amount of goods will be associated with mere toil and considered practically a vice. So those would be the effects, again, of concepts of property, even in Plato's laws, where property isn't all held in, isn't necessarily held in common. Now, Aristotle also makes a criticism of the Constitution as it's conceived in Plato's laws. He's already said that he doesn't say much about the Constitution or that it's very similar to what he says in the Republic. Aristotle specifically says, quote, in the laws it is maintained that the best Constitution is made up of democracy and tyranny, which are either not constitutions at all or are the worst of all. So he thinks that Plato's constructing an, uh, a supposedly ideal Constitution out of two corrupt forms of constitution, democracy and tyranny. But that's impossible or that's difficult. Now later, in later books where Aristotle himself argues that we can create a legitimate form of constitutional government by combining democracy and oligarchy, which themselves are bad and corrupt forms of constitution, he seems to be subject to the same criticism that he here levels against Plato. 
But this criticism is tempered by some nuances. In the laws, Plato actually advocates something like what Aristotle calls a constitutional government or polity or republic. Quote, the whole system of government tends to be neither democracy nor oligarchy, but something in a mean between them, which is usually called a polity. That's the end of the quote. Now, a polity is probably the best kind of constitution which is attainable by most states, but it is certainly not the best kind of constitution in an ideal sense. That would be either an aristocracy or some kind of mixed constitution like the Spartan, which has elements of oligarchy, monarchy, and kingship, because, as Aristotle says, the constitution is better which is made up of more numerous elements. Finally, Aristotle argues that the constitution of the laws is actually essentially an oligarchy, and its democratic aspects are very weak. For example, in appointing magistrates, although Plato advocates using lots, which would normally be considered a democratic measure, he limits the candidates to those that have already been selected, which tends to entrench those who are already in power. He also compels the rich to attend the assembly and vote on magistrates, but he does not compel the poor to do so, probably by fines. Uh, and he also seeks to have candidates selected from uh, the richest, uh, the greatest number and highest number of offices. So all of those are oligarchic elements. When you have that many oligarchic elements, they dwarf and crush the democratic elements, and you essentially end up with an oligarchy. And so this ideal form of constitution is nothing more than an oligarchy in Aristotle's views. Now, those are the criticisms of the Republic and the laws. I'll conclude, though Aristotle himself doesn't give an overall conclusion to the book, I'll just give some general observations about his criticisms of, of Plato here in the Politics, Book 2. First, Aristotle discusses Plato's Republican laws first not out of deference, but according to a methodology that he proceeds from the most radical proposals for a constitution to less radical proposals, beginning with Plato's own Republic and laws, and then carrying on to other named political theorists, which we'll discuss in the next lecture, Phileas and Hippodamus, and then to actually existing models, Sparta, Crete, and Carthage, which are also treated in a specific order, with the Spartan being the most radical and general uh, paradigmatic of existing constitutions, the others being deviations from this that are less radical. And then Aristotle ends up with a discussion of famous political theorists whose theorizing did not reach to the entire constitutional structure, but just to individual laws or pieces of legislation. Now, Aristotle elsewhere criticizes other aspects of these works of Plato, especially the Republic, not only in his politics, but also in other works such as On the Soul and Metaphysics. The criticisms here are narrowly focused on constitutional proposals and not meant to be comprehensive criticisms even of those works, like even of the detailed proposals for laws. Much less are they supposed to be a, a general criticism or rejection of Platonic philosophy in general. Also, Aristotle criticizes Plato on the basis of his own assumptions. We saw that in several cases. For example, about the nature of democracy, oligarchy, and constitutional government. And he doesn't just use Plato's own assumptions. And for this reason, they may seem, he may seem occasionally uncharitable against Plato. But if one accepts Aristotle's definitions and classifications, then the arguments probably seem more reasonable. And finally, I think it goes without saying that one of the things that Aristotle considers most ridiculous about Plato's Republic, his position on women, may seem, on the contrary, the most reasonable aspect of any of this to us. So Aristotle's criticisms, however, were very likely to be persuasive to his immediate audience, which also would have considered ridiculous the idea of making uh, women equal to men in education, military, and politics. But such arguments are much less persuasive than us, 
it's not even clear that they're arguments and not just appeals to bias, since uh, we, or at least most of us, have come to accept the equality of women in education, military, and politics that Plato in his Republic had merely imagined as a utopian ideal. Thank you.